the name of God, who creates and redeems all things, both seen and unseen. Quick show of hands in the room. How many people have seen the movie Stutz? I'm counting zero. Is this true? Maybe parts of it. Maybe we've heard about it. It's been written up a lot recently. That's Stutz, S-T-U-T-Z. Write it down. Remember it. Stutz, S-T-U-T-Z. It's a Netflix original. (laughs) Don't hold that against it. Uh, It is the best thing I've seen in years. Uh, It's 90 minutes long. It is a documentary by Jonah Hill about his uh, therapist, Phil Stutz. Now, you've perhaps heard of Phil Stutz, who's making the cycle, as people do once they gain some notoriety. People want to know about him. So he's he's doing the thing talking about therapy. Uh, This particular movie is uh, Jonah Hill wanting to talk about his therapist, Phil Stutz. Uh, And I won't go into the commentaries on it. You can read that yourselves. But I hope you will uh, uh, start your year off by giving 90 minutes of attention to this very important film. And I want to say particularly if if you self-identify as male, but for everybody, pay attention to it. Uh, In this uh, film, I don't want to spoil the whole thing because I actually want you to watch it. There are two pivotal moments out of 12, I would love to share two that I've got time to share that I think are important for us this morning. <clears throat> One of those moments in this film is, uh, is a spot now two years into the project of making this movie where uh, Jonah and Phil are sitting in a couple of chairs talking to each other about how the project of making the film is going. And, uh, and Jonah, who is deeply self-deprecating, and uh, which is part of the reason he spends time with Phil, he, he in his own way, is, is confiding to his therapist. He says, Phil, we've got, we've got a problem here. Uh, on the one hand, you're, you're my therapist, and so I would tend to bring stuff that I'm struggling with to you as a therapist, but I'm also trying to do a film about you, not necessarily as my therapist, but as, as a therapist, right? Not my therapist, but a therapist. And there's some role confusion in there about what I'm trying to do. And what it's doing is it's creating some conflict of conscience because the project isn't feeling authentic, right? He's struggling with the issue of the authenticity of the project. And and he, he goes through all these myriad things that they've had to change over the course of two years because, of course, lots has changed in those two years. His his hair has changed, so he takes off his wig and he says, I'm wearing a dumb wig because my hair looks different than it did two years ago when we started this. He said, we're in a different space. We have to film this in front of a green screen because we don't have access to the office with the beautiful books that used to be behind us. Now we have to fake the books on a green screen. And he's just having this conundrum about this whole dynamic in the movie. And he said, you know, I, I want you to know I'm really struggling with that. I don't know what to do. Uh, But it feels like I need to stop the performance, right? I need I need to get back to some authenticity here just for my own sake And he said what what do you think of that Phil? And of course Phil classic therapist says Well, Jonah that uh, that sounds like the right thing to do. You sound really convicted That sounds like the right thing to do. So that's what they do They instantly pull off the green screen there. You can see it behind a real green wall with tape on it Jonah takes off his, his, his wig, and here we are two years later, and they've, and they've agreed. This film is going to be about authenticity, right? We're going to work on authenticity in the film. That's one. Second moment is this. At the very end of the movie, um, Phil, Phil says to Jonah, here's your last project. Jonah says, I'm going to try to land the plane here, um, which will be true for this sermon eventually. I'll try to land it. He says, I'm going to try to land this movie, right? I want to land it well, and I need, I need you to help me do that. And, and Phil says, well, okay, easy. You, you've got two things that you need to do in order to land this well. First thing is, I want you to say a sentence describing um, your motivation for doing the film in the first place. And then I want you to say a sentence naming your motivation for having done the film from this place. So, first sentence, he says, 
okay, my motivation when I started this movie was to make a movie about my therapist who's got these great tools, and I wanted to share the tools with everybody so that they could benefit from this sort of therapeutic model like I have done. That's why I want to do the movie. Pause, breathe. Okay, now, Jonah, now looking back on it, why have you made this movie? Jonah says... Because I love you, and I care about you. You have made a profound difference in my life, and I want to share the story of you and us. That's why I have made this movie. Two radically different motivations. The issue of authenticity and of dealing with the pressures that we all deal with, that stuff that Richard Rohr talks about, about the first half of life project of putting an ego together that is that sort of strong bulwark that helps us get through a world that is hard and challenging and that just beats us up on a regular basis, that uh, challenges or that, that, that diminishes some behaviors and personalities and it rewards others. We all go through that project in the first half of life of creating a public persona and there's a lot of upside to that, right? There's a lot of upside to that. We, we develop capacities in, in a, a sense of public-facing strength and capacity, uh, maybe even a sense of humor. Um, but the underside of that project, according to Rohr and everybody else who does this work, um, is obvious, right? The underbelly of that work is that a whole bunch of stuff uh, gets hidden, right? Pushed aside, denied, um, and in clinical terms, a bunch of that stuff shows up in the shadow, and they talk about shadow in this film. But right? it shows up in those spaces where we would prefer that they remain unseen, right? Because we want to live in the realm of the seen. And of course, if you're going to live in the realm of the seen with any success and credibility, there's a certain amount of performance that seems to be expected of us, not only as members of this society and of this particular church, not this congregation, but of this denomination, um, but, but also just as human creatures, there's a certain amount of performance. I mean, part of it is just there's some behavior that's not allowed in society, right? A bunch of that's good stuff to kind of hide a little bit. Good to know about why you're screaming into the windshield at somebody who's done some crazy thing. Like you might think there's some shadow work to do there. But, but there's other stuff that we put there that is good stuff. We, we park a bunch of good stuff in the shadow. It's not a space of shame. It's a space where all the stuff goes that has not been publicly rewarded, right, for our public creature. Some of the stuff that shows up there, and this is Jonah's issue, is all of the dynamics around vulnerability, of intimacy, both in word and in deed. And, right, so there's scripts that we tend to. And this whole movie is about kind of getting out from under that. Um, and what a gift uh, to start my year with this, uh, to see Jonah, a public figure, uh, popularizing not just the tools, which you can get anywhere, um, but popularizing the disposition to do the work, right? Because this is our work, all of us, each and every one of us, because the stuff in the shadow tends to be huge liability if it stays there. Right? And we know that because we believe in a God, we're going to say it in the creed here in a few minutes, who created all things, seen and unseen. God wants the lot of it, everything. God wants everything. God can't do any conversion work with us as whole human beings unless it's all available to the light of God. The story we hear about this morning, the story of Jesus' baptism in the Jordan, is about a number of things. And, and I hope that you'll spend time going and finding other sermons to listen in on, because folks will do doctrinal things, and that's great. I'm not particularly interested in doctrine. What I'm interested in is Jesus, the person we prayed about at Christmas Eve services, what we call the perfect, capital M, man— by which we mean human. Sorry, everybody. That's why I said human, not man, when I prayed it. The perfect human. It's Jesus. This is a story about the perfect person. And by perfect, we mean whole. 
The story of Jesus is the story of a whole person who invites us to join him in the adventure of wholeness. That's what this whole thing is about, right? So if you're worried about whether you got the right beliefs or whether you're genuflecting or kneeling or sitting at the proper time, get over it. (laughs) This is about wholeness. This is about things seen and unseen. And it is about our trust in a God who invites all of it to be fodder for the spiritual life. Not just between us and God, but between us and each other. Right? So when Jesus baptizes, it's not, some people like to talk about, well, was he sinful or not? Why did he get baptized? Not interested. Jesus is joining a body of human beings who have agreed to together work on recognition, repentance, reckoning, repair, and reconciliation. Jesus is joining with a body of people who are going to practice wholeness. These are the practices of wholeness, and we all do it. If Jesus didn't have to do it, we'd have no reason to think we should have to do it. But because Jesus did it as the perfect whole human being, we're invited into it. And we're asked to do it with a spirit of absolute trust and confidence. Because our Lord has done it. The one who saves us did the same thing and said, Hey, I got nothing to hide. Right? This is where doctrine is not helpful, suggesting perhaps he's perfect. Maybe he doesn't have anything to hide. I don't believe it. Jesus, the perfect human, invites us to join in this posture of practice. The process of bringing everything to the light. Because when we dig down underneath all of that stuff, and we bring it forward, we might come actually to recognize what he finally hears for the first time publicly. What he finally hears for the first time about himself. Not just that he's a good practitioner of the tradition. Not just that he's a gifted prophet and teacher. um, Not just that he's a wonder worker. You know, uh, because that's great public facing stuff. I mean, who's not going to get praise for that? But what we actually come to hear, what he discovers in this process of setting his whole life before God at the moment of baptism is... Even though all that stuff is true, he is most fundamentally beloved child of God. Now, we have some fundamental beliefs about ourselves, right? One of which is, we say it even if we don't believe it all the time, we, like Jesus, are beloved children of God. And how difficult is it for each one of us to get to that spot where we can honestly set before God who loves us and and who we should be able to trust with our whole selves and share everything with, both those things seen and unseen, and trust that even though we're going to have stuff we've got to tend to, right, Lent's coming, fear not, I'll say something about that in a second, we're going to have work to do, and underneath all of that self-deprecation, underneath all of that denial— we might discover that we, too, are beloved children of God with all the rights, and here's the harder part, responsibilities that that identity brings with it. Because like Jesus, our spiritual practice isn't just between us and God anymore when we baptize into this practice Right? Those things that we're hiding, we're not just hiding from ourselves and lying to ourselves. We're not just hiding and lying to God, but we're hiding and lying to each other. And in the spiritual practice, the reason God calls a body of people together is that we practice these things together. It's great that we practice the daily office. It's great that we practice um, singing. It's great that we practice uh, doing um, acolyting and every, every, every little thing that we do, reading scripture. It's great. And the practice of being honest about the depths of our hearts and our souls and the contents thereof. That is the practice. That is the practice that is about wholeness. Wholeness of the person. Offering to God not just the things seen, but those things unseen. Being honest with ourselves, being honest with God, being honest with each other. That's what Jesus has modeled in his baptism 
at the River Jordan. That not just does he do this, not just does old folks a long time ago do this, but when we do this, and when we renew our commitment to having done that, we recommit to doing this work together in the depths of our hearts, in the presence of God, in the company of each other. This is a corporate venture. And while this may sound soft and fuzzy, and while the overall context is love, both God's love for us, our love for ourselves, and our love for each other, while that sounds soft, and folks outside of this tradition, quite honestly, disparage it as soft religion, there is nothing more courageous than facing the darkness of our own soul. Because it is from there that all the darkness around us emerges. We cannot do anything around us until we've done it within. This is hard work. It is courageous work. It is not for the faint of heart. And so when we commit to it, we actually commit to changing the world by changing ourselves and our place and our practice within it. Epiphany, as I've said several times before when I preached this, right, this stretches on, this Epiphany Tide stretches on to Ash Wednesday, which is only a few short weeks away on the 22nd of February. And the season of Epiphany more, of Epiphany, more than anything else, is the celebration of manifestation, right? It's the celebration of revelation among us. And not just the good stuff, not the easy stuff, not just the stuff that is seen, not the stuff that shows up in artwork and on cards and on wrapping paper, lovely though that is, but this is the season of the manifestations and the revelations and the epiphanies of the hard stuff that keeps us stuck. The hard stuff that keeps us somewhere short of whole. Right? So my prayer for Epiphany Tide for each of us would be that we have the courage and the trust to shine the light bright within us, in our hearts and in our minds, in our souls, to get really honest, and not just honest, but brutally specific about those things that are holding us back from living into the fullness and the abundance of the life that God has promised for us and for the world around us. And it's that specificity that we carry to Lent, where we, in this space, in this realm, do the public recognition of those things. We share with one another, or at least with a confessor, we share with one another the recognition of those things that are holding us back. We do the hard work of repenting publicly and concretely with each other in front of God those things that are keeping us somewhere less than whole. And then we get to the hard work of reckoning. What do we do about it? Do we want to do something about it? We do the hard work of repair which can be awkward, because it's often relational. And we may well find ourselves ready after all that for what we love to praise, because it's the public-facing stuff. It's the stuff we give ribbons for is the reconciliation. But be clear, that is the end of a very long process of openness and honesty and radical transparency with ourselves, with God, and with each other. Friends, I pray that this epiphany is not just a good reminder that God is a God who can be trusted, that God is a lover of our souls, who we can entrust to every dark corner of ourselves, who doesn't show up to judge, who shows up in deep delight that we're even willing to open the space up. And that that's a God who wants to invite you to do the work, who will be with you while you do the work. Will be a God who will be with you when you experience the public consequences of radical personal change. When you flip the script, you choose a different path, perhaps. You deviate from the public expectation for you. This is a God who will be with us. This is a God who will not leave us alone. 
This is a God who's excited for each of us to figure out who we are, who we've been created to be, who wants to help us be whole as that, not just privately, but publicly, and then to celebrate it, to affirm it, and to deploy it for the salvation of the world. And it starts with each of us in the depths of our hearts, the depths of our minds, in the depths of our souls, with the bright light of this epiphany tide. Amen.